everyone. About ready to get started now. Um, there's no moderator uh, for this session, so it's me. I'm introducing myself. I'm Joyce Ray from Johns Hopkins University, um, and I'll be talking about uh, my talk is based on a meeting that we had last October on uh, digital curation in art museums and what emerged from it in terms of promising practices and opportunities for education and research. And uh, so this is based on uh, the Master of Arts in Museum Studies program at Johns Hopkins coming out of that program. And then my area within that is the Graduate Certificate in Digital Curation. And I'll talk a little bit more about these programs too. Uh, the MA program was launched in 2008. It's mostly online, uh, except for a two-week required on-ground seminar that has held various locations in the U.S. and also outside the U.S. We have students from 44 states and 10 countries currently, uh, quite a wide age, ra age range of uh, students. So some are just starting out, some are changing careers, or doing something that you know, they've always wanted to do, and now they decided this is the time to do it. 70% uh, approximately of our students are already working in museums. So this is designed as a part-time program, although we do have some full-time students as well. And about 9% have another graduate degree. Uh, and we already have over 400 graduates from the master's program. We know that digital curation jobs uh, in museums are emerging because we see job postings on the Museum L listserv. For example, things like collection data assistant, uh, digital archivist, digital asset management specialist, digital collections manager, digital content manager, digital projects manager. So um, all these different job titles, so we know there are some out there. Uh, we also know from a previous meeting that we uh, put together in 2013 prior to launching the digital curation program, uh, we uh, brought together a number of educators as well as employers, including from the major um, institutions in Washington, the <coughs> Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and the museum people who came told us they really do need staff with digital curation skills. They would prefer to hire what they call their own, that is people with museum experience and a deep understanding of the museum mission, but they are hiring librarians and archivists instead because there haven't been opportunities for museum professionals to acquire uh, these, the skills and knowledge of digital curation. So that's really what inspired us to launch this program. Uh, it was a little soft rollout at first. It officially launched in 2014 with a dual degree option so that um, students could come in and take just the digital certificate uh, program alone of six courses, uh, five of which are core and one elective. Um, or they could get a combined uh, master's degree in museum studies and the digital curation certificate. Uh, it also is almost all online. We do have an on-site requirement that is part of an internship requirement for the certificate. We currently have about 35 students in the program. We'll probably have a few more by next fall because we have rolling admission. Uh, we're admitting students all the time. So most of the students uh, are also entering the museum uh, studies program and going for the dual degree, in which case they get a two course um, uh, discount, uh, I guess you could say. They get to count two courses towards both the MA and the certificate. So in that case, they complete a total of uh, 14 courses, otherwise it would be 16, 10 for the MA, six for the uh, certificate. And the most common backgrounds in the certificate program, uh, backgrounds and interests are in archaeology, art and art history, collection management, history, and historical collections. 
so the meeting that I mentioned was uh, supported in part by the Samuel H. Crest Foundation. We also got a little uh, funding from the Johns Hopkins Investment Bank, and we had this two-day seminar uh, October 8th and 9th of uh, this last fall. We had uh, 29 participants. That includes representatives of the museum, museum archives, research centers, funding organizations, consultants, digital exhibition designers, uh, myself and uh, Phyllis Hatch, who's the director of the MA uh, <coughs> in Museum Studies program, and Diane Zorich, who is a cultural heritage consultant, who um, was actually fabulous to help us uh, kind of scope the meeting. Uh, she made great recommendations. She was the facilitator, and she um, wrote our final report for, uh, for us. So we had representatives from 14 museums. I won't read all the names of them, but uh, they're uh, kind of a mix of some smaller uh, college uh, art museums, uh, medium-sized museums, uh, and some very large museums uh, around the country. Now I said 14 museums. There were 13 job titles from these museums. <laughs> we had two directors. And uh, everything else was a unique job title. So um, chief information officer, one person with curator in his title, curator of digital and emerging media. Uh, but we had a collections data manager, chief of digital imaging, associate media conservator, uh, chief digital officer. So all these different titles, job titles, are people who are involved with digital curation in their museums in, in some way. Okay, so our first topic was, <laughs> what do we mean by digital curation? Now, we could have spent the whole meeting talking about this um, because, you know, 14 museums, 13 job titles, everybody kind of brought a different perspective. And I think the person who actually had the job title of uh, digital curator for a museum was hyperventilating <laughs> because he said, you know, he had never heard of some of this stuff. And um, he was actually hired, I think, to be a social media manager of social media program, although he had gotten into other things as well. But um, so we finally ended that by uh, conversation by saying, okay, well, we've already defined <laughs> what digital curation means for our program. So that's what we're going to use uh, during the course of this meeting. And what we say is the, it is the planning and management of digital assets over their lifetime from conceptualization through active use and presentation to long-term preservation in a repository for future use. And uh, this, of course, is derived mostly from the uh, definition and the digital curation lifecycle model developed by the Digital Curation Center in the UK. And I say mostly because, uh, well, for one thing, they kind of keep changing their definition. <laughs> but we added uh, the concept of pr presentation to our definition because we feel that that's so important for museums. It's not just use, it's, it's thinking about how you're going to uh, present digital assets as well. So uh, these are the challenges that we identified uh, to address. Uh, sustaining and archiving innovative displays for audience engagement, <coughs> managing digital assets for preservation and access, adapting curatorial practices to curating, displaying, and preserving digital art. OK, so um, topic one, going back to that, was the definition of digital curation. Topic two, the challenge, how do museums engage audiences in innovative ways? How do they manage and sustain innovative digital projects? So uh, this is the gallery wall from the Cleveland Museum of Art, a um, very kind of innovative concept where when you enter the museum, you see this wall and you can uh, pull up uh, with the touch screen any of these works uh, that you see here, read something about them before you go um, 
to uh, visit the uh, collections in the museum. And it was developed by this company called Local Projects, and we had a representative from the company, uh, as well as somebody from the Cleveland Museum of Art, talk to us about how they had developed um, these, these uh, concepts. So the first, first question that came up is, what is the shelf life of innovative experiential projects? And you know, the first question that was asked of the um, person from local projects was, uh, well, how do you sustain uh, this work? And he started answering, and it became obvious that he was, his concept of sustainability was how well people remembered what they had seen uh, and, and how they reacted to it and how long they retained that. So it was a completely different understanding of um, what is sustainability for them. So that led to you know, what needs to be preserved. What is the archival unit of an interactive project and who is responsible? So um, you know, we didn't exactly answer some of those questions, but we did answer who is responsible by uh, reaching a uh, consensus view that the museum bears the responsibility of considering preservation at the very beginning of the development process, not after a project has been designed and implemented. A couple of other, um, I think, significant takeaways were, uh, included the um, idea that today's digital curation is retrospective and the recognition of that and that we are aiming uh, for prospective uh, digital curation. We should be moving towards building tool sets that people work in and that automatically capture and curate data at the point of creation and use. The focus must shift to making things curatable as we go along, not after an activity has been completed. Okay, so moving to topic three, how should museums manage their digital assets for long-term preservation and access? And I think um, certainly one of the most, if not the most um, uh, farther ahead, I guess, museums in this area is uh, MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art. So um, this was a presentation that I'm really drawing on by Ben Fino Radin, who is, um, uh, the associate media conservator at MoMA. And he talked about the uh, digital vault that they have developed that has three parts, uh, what he called the packager, the warehouse, and the indexer. So the packager creates an archival information package containing the objects, standard-based metadata, and uh, they're using Archivematica software. Uh, and then the um, archival information package is, gets written uh, via Archivum software to very fast disk and tape. They have copies stored at MoMA Manhattan, MoMA Queens, and also offline at MoMA's Film Preservation Center in Hamlin, Pennsylvania. And they run uh, integrity checks uh, based on the LOCKS model, LOCKS of copies keep stuff safe so that if there's a corrupted uh, copy somewhere, they'll replace it with a good one. Uh, and then they also have a tracking system, an indexer they call Binder. And they said that they um, looked around to see if there was anything that would meet their needs. They felt that nothing did. So they developed this Binder uh, themselves, uh, which scans uh, the archival information packages extracts rich technical metadata, facilitates on-demand streaming access to all collections material, which provides both access and <coughs> preservation. Um, and this is open source and it's available on GitHub. So their entire ecosystem <coughs> includes uh, stage one, which is acquisition and registration of digital materials in a collections management system. Stage two is the digital vault, the repository and access system. 
and stage three is the, uh, the dams, the digital asset management system. And all systems talk to each other, but stages one and two are still um, human-centered. So um, this ecosystem keeps the repository and access system in-house so that the total cost of ownership of digital assets can be estimated. They had concerns about cost and trustworthiness of cloud storage. And uh, one thing that they mentioned that um, I think they're probably right that at least uh, museums have not really considered this, that in using cloud storage, you know, if the company goes out of business or um, you decide you want to move your data somewhere else, there's going to be a cost involved and that uh, may be very hard to project what that cost would be. So that was one reason that they wanted to keep control over it themselves. Um, so uh, that, that was um, the cost reason was, and the trustworthiness were both important factors uh, in their determination to do this internally. Uh, currently, it's used only for collections assets, not yet for other holdings, so like their imaging and visual resources. And they also felt that it may not scale well if uh, MoMA continues to acquire film at the rate it has been doing. Um, that could be a problem uh, in the future. Uh, it also, they acknowledge, won't scale for small to medium-sized institutions. They thought it could work on a consortium model or, um, you know, at the low end of the spectrum, small museums could copy their collections to hard drives and store them in different locations. They thought that Hydra in a box is promising, however, uh, they were wary of turnkey solutions that uh, they thought might require considerable customization to meet museum needs. And so uh, they felt that a near turnkey solution might be preferable. And uh, a takeaway from that is it took MoMA 100 years to acquire 3,500 paintings. They thought it is not unreasonable to assume that in the next 100 years it will acquire more than 3,500 digital works. So um, definitely a challenging problem. So uh, moving to topic four, how are curatorial practices changing in the curation, display, and preservation of digital art? Uh, so I just want to get some clarification terminology here. Uh, you may often hear the term time-based media art, which is used a lot in uh, museums um, to, to mean works that have duration is basically what it means. So it's a beginning and an end, whether it's a video or interactive um, work. Uh, it could often be the same as digital art, but digital art ne doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, it's not necessarily time-based and by the same token, you can have something that's time-based, it's not digital. But um, this is, an example of time-based media art that was uh, a portrait of a uh, late night talk show host, um, David Letterman, Conan O'Brien, and Jay <coughs> Leno, um, that obviously when you, you could play it and it has, you know, a beginning and an end, so that's an example of time-based media art. So speaking of digital art in general, uh, Challenges, lack of resources and expertise creates barriers to acquisition in the first place because people are concerned that they don't know how to preserve it or they won't be able to afford it and um, that that is probably resulting in a loss uh, of some art that you know, might otherwise be acquired by museums. There's an inadequate vocabulary to even describe the components and the functionality for documentation. <coughs> There's a lack of criteria for determining what is the archival unit that should be preserved for future restaging. 
and it usually is a retrospective endeavor. Um, so, you know, after creation, when we already said that that's not what you want to do, but, you know, that's the reality. So um, here's an example of uh, a work in digital art, William Kentridge's Tango for Page Turning, that was uh, purchased a, as a joint purchase by a consortium of small art museums in New England. And um, it provides greater access to the work and also enables institutions to acquire works that would be impossible uh, if they did it individually. So in this case, each institution has a copy, but the work is displayed at only one institution at a time. And in this case, they also worked with the artist who uh, was very excited and uh, supportive of the idea of this joint purchase because it would expose the work to um, different audiences and it would always be on display somewhere. Um, but they've already found that each um, institution had different ideas about approaches to preservation. So that's their next step, is to work through those issues uh, collaboratively and come up with a preservation solution. Uh, one other um, thought that emerged from that, an idea was that large art museums might help their smaller peers by sharing resources and expertise. In turn, small museums can give their larger peers access to new and diverse audiences. Uh, one uh, resource that I just want to mention if you're interested in more information about preserving digital art is a book uh, by Richard Reinhardt, who um, is now at the uh, Samet Museum at Bucknell University, uh, written with John Ippolito. Recollection, Art, New Media, and Social Memory that has um, a, a lot of good um, discussion about approaches to preserving uh, art that's digital or um, uh, hybrid mixed media. So other summit topics that I'm not going to go into here but that are uh, discussed in the report or um, the organizational challenges of course, the technology is only one. The probably bigger challenges is the people and the processes. Uh, digital art history, things like online scholarly catalogs, uh, and the role that museums can play uh, in that. Collaborative access projects like the American Art Collaborative that is doing a linked open data <coughs> uh, pilot. And international collaborations like uh, the Europeana Digital Library and uh, the work of the International Committee on Documentation, which is a committee of uh, ICOM, the International Council on Museums. And then we come to the uh, final part of our meeting and the final part of my discussion, which is the uh, discussion of education and research opportunities. And uh, as I said, just a refresher in our certificate program, we have five core courses, uh, three of which are uh, taught, digital preservation, the foundations of digital curation course, uh, managing digital information museums that goes into a little more um, hands-on work with some software. Uh, but in addition to that, there's an on-ground internship that uh, it's a whole semester course, but students must spend at least 120 hours uh, on site with the host institution, but they can complete the project uh, online, you know, not necessarily there. Uh, there's also a research requirement that uh, it's not really a thesis requirement, but it allows students to explore, do research on an area of digital curation that is of interest to them, and there's certainly plenty of opportunities in the museum world. There's so little research being done in this area that we feel that it's really going to uh, make a contribution to the literature as well as let students develop some expertise in their own area of interest. And then they get one elective as well. So we really wanted to consult with this community <coughs> while we had them there uh, about you know, how we could make this program as effective as possible. Uh, so we had the uh, questions posed to small group breakout sessions. Um, 
these are the questions that they addressed. What next steps can the art museum community take to move digital curation forward in their institutions? What are key principles of digital curation internships in art museums? And what are the roles and responsibilities of all partners involved? Uh, finally, what research projects might students and interns undertake that will contribute to digital curation and advance the museum's mission? And uh, so these were some of the uh, recommendations that emerged. One was to resolve the ambiguity that exists around the terms digital curation and digital curator. So we'll leave that to the broader community. I don't think we'll be <laughs> tackling that. Uh, and, and really these recommendations are not just to us, but, but to the museum community, so to themselves. Uh, create an advocacy strategy, highlight good digital curation work that's going on in art museums, clarify principles of digital curation internships or residencies, and identify partners and responsibilities, identify innovative digital curation research projects that might be undertaken by students or interns. So, um, ideas for resolving this ambiguity was one is to recognize that digital curation is a core function, it's not an add-on that caring for digital collections is as critical as caring for physical collections, that digital curation adds value to digital assets, that it's more than just preservation, it should enable better visitor experiences <coughs> across all platforms, and facilitate interactions between curators and other users of digital collections and assets. It encompasses practices that overlay all museum professions, and a diverse workforce is key to accomplishing digital curation tasks. Different points of view ensure that digital assets are cared for and used in ways that serve the widest range of audiences. Uh, so, uh, thoughts, recommendations for creating an uh, advocacy strategy is one, use professional networks to raise awareness in key uh, organizations, work with digital curators in other communities, i.e. librarians and archivists primarily, uh, create low barrier professional development opportunities such as workshops and professional conferences, and identify and support activist digital curators within institutions. To highlight digital curation work that's going on, uh, they uh, recommended compiling stories of easily relatable and understood successes, bust myths to dispel misinformation, such as the uh, fear that if you digitize your whole collection and put it online that nobody will come to the museum, which, you know, that evidence is pretty strong now that it works just the opposite. It attracts more people. And I can certainly say from the students, uh, my students, uh, if they don't see a robust website, when they visit a website, they just conclude that it's kind of lame organization and you know even though you might know that's not really true you, I think you know younger people today just have that concept uh, okay they also recommended creating awards that recognize best practice in digital curation as well as innovation and also raising awareness through programs and professional organizations and through internal channels uh, clarify principles of internships, identify partners and responsibilities. In general, they felt uh, they should provide value to the host institution as well as to the student. They should not be used to just to fill resource gaps and they should offer lessons to the broader community. To identify innovative research projects, they um, wanted to invite relevant professional organizations to frame research questions of interest to their communities that might be structured into appropriate projects. And a number of these people are involved in these communities, so um, I think, you know, what I'm hoping is that uh, this will kind of seamlessly uh, eke out into the 
uh, broader museum uh, uh, infrastructure. And uh, just some ideas about uh, internships or research projects. Uh, one is inventory and analysis of unorganized digital collections like removable media. I've already had one student who did that for her internship uh, project. Uh, possibly analyzing controlled vocabularies and recommend how those might be expanded. Uh, analyze collection data for potential innovative uses. Uh, study on documentation and preservation of user experience with technology. I thought this was interesting. Documentation of digital staff roles and practices uh, in museums with the potential for comparing across them because I think museums are, um, they don't normally collect this kind of data and compare themselves with other museums. And so they're kind of each one developing their own approach and not, uh, they don't have a good way for looking across uh, museums and seeing what they might learn from comparison. And also uh, assessing digital tools in use to identify gaps and improvements needed. Okay, so finally the report, and this was supposed to be the point where I said, oh, and I have some copies here that I brought with me that I'm gonna give to you, and unfortunately the FedEx box went astray, so I don't have the reports. They just came out, and they look great, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> But um, now this is a very long URL uh, that includes the uh, PowerPoint presentations as well as the Twitter back channel. If you want to take a picture of it, go ahead and give me a chance. Or you can just email me, <laughs> jray16, that's very easy, at jhu.edu. I'll be happy to send you the link. Or I might even <coughs> be able to send you a, a, a print copy if you want one. And um, so that's my presentation. I'm delighted to have so many people here, really more than uh, I expected. So very uh, interested in hearing comments or questions. And uh, thank you. <laughs>